Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from World Video Bible School called Six Reasons Not to Believe in Evolution, Proof for God. Well, he definitely tries to give six reasons not to believe in evolution, but he doesn't even begin to show anything that would count as proof for God. And for the record, I'm not going to correct him every time he says proof instead of evidence. I know that's what he meant, and if you didn't before, you do now. So let's go! In the year 2002, in Cobb County, Georgia, there was a sticker that was placed on the inside cover of the biology textbooks. That sticker simply said that these textbooks contain information on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, about living organisms, and it should be looked at with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. Yeah, that sticker was placed on textbooks, and there are several problems with this, not the least of which is the confusion about what a scientific theory is. This sticker promoted the idea that a theory will eventually graduate to the status of fact if only it could accumulate enough evidence. This is simply not the case. The theory of gravity is still a theory. Cell theory is still a theory. In science, a theory is a comprehensive body of knowledge that describes and explains a collection of facts and data. Evolution would not be a scientific theory if it were not true. And when the school board was sued over this sticker, the courts ruled that it was unconstitutional both by the state constitution and the US constitution because it's trying to sneak religion into the science class. Do you know if you were to take the sentiments of that sticker and you were to look at the evidences for evolution with an open mind and you study them carefully and you critically consider them, what you would find is that evolution is true. That facts and data contained within the theory of evolution have been studied critically for hundreds of years now. And those of you who are decent at math might have noticed that my pluralization of the word hundreds takes us before Darwin. Yes, you're right because the facts that led to the discovery of the mechanisms for evolution were known before Darwin's time. Linnaeus developed his taxonomic system through the 1730s, and if you want to be pedantic, farmers have been using evolution for thousands of years as they plant seeds from their best yielding plants in order to try and get a better yield the next harvest. But I have this strange feeling that that's not how your sentence was going to end, so you were saying that if you study the evidence for evolution and examine it critically, what you find is... These evidences don't prove evolution at all. Only when you cherry pick and quote mine. I have yet to see any single creationist argument that doesn't rely completely on ignoring most of the data of any particular subject. Here are six supposed evidences for evolution that simply are not good reasons to believe in evolution. You sound like a high school kid trying to meet the word count. You could have just stuck with saying the words that are on the screen and that would have been just as effective at getting your point across. Number one. Vestigial organs. Is this where you explain why God gave us a tail that disappears for most people in the uterus? Or why we have muscles around our ears that actively try to point our ears in the direction of loud or distracting noises despite the fact that the muscles are too weak to move our rigid ears? Or why we get goosebumps, which in other mammals serves to fluff up their fur to keep them warm or make them look bigger, but in us just makes our arm hair and leg hair look funny? Or why our eyes have the leftovers of a nictitating membrane, which is essentially a third eyelid? There was even a case where a nine-year-old girl had to have her nictitating membrane removed because she somehow actually developed it over her left eye. I could go on, there are many more obviously vestigial features in the human body alone, but let's see what you bring up. In 1865, a German anatomist named Robert Weidersheim said that he discovered 185 different useless or virtually useless organs in the body. And he said this was evidence of evolution. Well, actually, the list was only 86 items long, and it was published in 1895. Rather small details to be sure, but it goes to show that you're not paying great attention to detail, so from here on out, every word you say is suspect. I mean, it's not like I trusted you to begin with, but yeah, attention to detail and all that. In fact, the argument goes that if humans evolved, then they would have had at one time organs that an animal would have used in a certain way, but would no longer be used in that way in the human body, and those organs would begin to atrophy and start to be useless. Not necessarily useless. Sometimes the use changes, like how the pelvis of a whale is left over from when the whale ancestors had legs, but it's now used to anchor muscles that the whales use to make their penises do tricks. 
It's clearly a pelvis with cute little bitty wigs and all, but the legs are useless as legs, so now it uses it to wave its dick around like a trick kite. The problem with this vestigial organ idea is that there are two reasons it cannot prove evolution. Number one, if you did have vestigial organs in your body, that wouldn't prove evolution. Yeah, you're right. A sloppy designer could have included a bunch of defunct features from other animals in our bodies because they were too lazy to change their design too much between the closely related species. Uh, sorry, I mean what appear to be closely related species. Because I'm pretty sure you don't think we're related to chimps, even though we are genetically more similar to chimps than chimps are to gorillas. You see, evolution has to go from a single-celled organism to a human. No, it didn't have to go there. That's just where it did go. Nothing in evolution is preordained. And you don't need organs that are decaying and atrophying. You need evolution to produce new organs. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Organs that are not necessary can start to go away at the same time as new organs develop. We should find wings that are almost ready to allow organisms to fly that can't yet fly. Like the wings of Archaeopteryx? Those wings? Or how about the flaps of skin that help gliding animals like flying squirrels? We don't know where this will be in a few million years because evolution doesn't work toward a goal, but it is possible that they will end up being another type of flying mammal. See, that's the problem with what you're expecting here. If flight were to develop independently again, it would not be in the exact same way that has already developed. This is actually how we know that flight evolved four separate times, because each time was different. In insects, there are no bones in the wings whatsoever. In pterosaurs, they developed a really long pinky finger which connects a flap of skin to the back legs. In bats, they developed flaps of skin between all their fingers which also attach to the back legs. In birds, the digits have fused together and the feathers have grown out the back. So we do not know what a future wing might look like, and since we don't know what the future wing might look like, we can't know what an underdeveloped version of this unknown future wing would look like. We should find new visionary optical connections in living organisms that don't have them. Wait, you want to find optical connections in organisms that don't have optical connections? That's a tiny bit incoherent, don't you think? But that being said, there are organisms alive today that have all kinds of eyes, from just a photosensitive patch of cells on a flatworm to our own complicated mess of an eye. So we can see organisms alive today that have all of the intermediate steps that would have been required to evolve towards our eyes. So why couldn't our eyes have just evolved through the path that we can still see today? We should see things adding information, not losing genetic information. How do you define information here? Because gene duplication is a thing. That's where an entire gene gets two copies of itself in the genome where there should only be one. That's more information in the sense that there are now physically more bits of genetic material. In plants, whole genome duplication is actually fairly common. But you don't necessarily need more genes to make something more complicated. What the genes do actually matters, believe it or not, and sometimes the change that adds a new structure or function will result from a change in existing genetic material rather than the addition of new genetic material. When pressed about this, creationists will typically come up with a top-level change sort of definition of information, like, could a dog ever grow wings? But of all the amniotes, birds actually have the smallest genome, meaning that the addition of wings does not necessarily require the addition of more information. And with how evolution works, dog wings would probably develop by making changes to what is already there, so on a genome level, the addition of wings to dogs would not necessarily require more actual genetic material, just changes to the material that's already there. And of course, let's not forget that dog wings wouldn't look anything like bird wings should they ever evolve, because that's not how evolution works. If dogs were to develop wings, it would probably be more akin to the flaps of skin found on sugar gliders than actual feathered bird wings. My point here is that you can't just look at the morphology of an animal and deduce how much genetic material it has, because the amount of genetic material does not necessarily correlate with morphology. In fact, the organism with the largest known genome is a simple flower, the Paris japonica, with a genome 50 times the size of the human genome. So if we're measuring the amount of genetic material to get our definition of information, humans should be far simpler than this flower. But I don't think anyone would be willing to argue that our brains are less complex than a flower. So all this to say that we need a working definition of information before you can claim that we should see things adding rather than losing information. And the second problem with the vestigial organ 
argument is that that 185 list of vestigial organs, it began to dwindle very rapidly when? When we started looking more closely into them and it became 180 and then 175 and then... Two things here. First, even with your definition of vestigial as being a completely useless evolutionary leftover, that list has not dwindled down to zero. I gave several examples earlier of structures in the human body alone that serve no current function. But I suspect that you know this, or you might have actually said out loud that it has dwindled down to zero. But you want to maintain plausible deniability, so you just heavily implied it without actually saying it, so that if somebody calls you out on it, you can backtrack and say, well, it's a lot smaller than it was at any rate. But second and more important, in order for a structure to be vestigial, it does not have to be completely useless. To be vestigial, it has to have lost some or all of its ancestral function. So going back to the whale pelvis example, the ancestral function of the pelvis was the attachment spot for the hind legs. Since whales no longer have hind legs, their pelvises no longer serve this ancestral function. But they do anchor muscles that are important to their reproduction. Evolution often utilizes existing structures for new purposes just just like this. Do you know as we look more into the body, we realize that those vestigial organs were very useful, many of them extremely useful. Yeah, I'm sure that the muscles around your ears that are too weak to actually do anything but still try to swivel your ears towards sounds are going to be found to have some extremely useful function outside of this. Evolution repurposes things all the time, and this is exactly what we would expect if it were true. So even if we did find alternate purposes for these evolutionary leftovers that obviously weren't designed for their new purposes, that does not help your case. Number two, the idea of homology. We're told that similarity proves ancient ancestry. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's more about how these similarities fit perfectly into a nested hierarchy of ancestry. We don't just look at the bones of the forelimbs, see that all vertebrates have the same bone structure there with fairly minor modifications, and declare that they all must have had some common ancestor because of this. There's more to it than that. If there were some intelligent designer who poofed everything into existence all at once, he didn't need to put his design into categories like this. He could have made a fish with fur. He could have made a mammal that isn't an amniote. I know you're going to claim that homology is evidence that everything was designed by the same guy with the same style, but there are so many vast different creatures on this planet that have different styles of adaptation that this still doesn't quite fit. Everything that fits into the mammal category also fits perfectly into the amniote, tetrapod, and vertebrate categories, but those categories have multiple branches that lead to other groups that do not fit into the mammal category. Amphibians share characteristics with all other tetrapods and vertebrates, but they don't have amniotic eggs or hair. Are you telling me that no amphibian could have benefited from having fur? And what I simply mean by that is we're told that because humans have similar physical characteristics to certain animals, that proves that they evolved from animals. It demonstrates that not only did we evolve from animals, but that we are still animals. Linnaeus himself, father of taxonomy, tried to find a way to distinguish humans from the rest of the animal kingdom, but reluctantly was forced to admit that we fit perfectly into the ape category. There are plenty of things God could have done differently to distinguish us from the rest of the apes. For one, maybe don't create the rest of the apes. Why make something so morphologically and genetically similar to human beings if you want humans to be completely separate from the animals? He could have made us protostomes instead of deuterostomes. He could have designed a separate body plan to separate us from the vertebrates. He could have given us extra limbs to separate us from the tetrapods. He could have had us fit perfectly into the mammal category like we do now, but given us feathers instead of hair. Or he could have designed something completely new instead of feathers or hair. He could have had us fit perfectly into the mammal category, but feed our babies with something other than milk. Every characteristic of human morphology puts us perfectly in the ape category of the animal kingdom. Well, similarity doesn't prove evolution at all. In fact, you could see things that are similar and you would realize that those similarities are often caused by a common designer. In other words, God was too stupid or too lazy to actually make the special part of his creation look special, so he made them look just like they would if they were evolved animals instead. Sure, that is possible, but it's not a good look for your God.
Suppose there were a supernatural intelligent designer and he created a world where many organisms would need to drink the same water, eat the same kinds of food, walk over the same types of terrain. What would happen? That depends entirely on the end goal of this hypothetical creator. If the end goal is to make one particular species of his creation more special than the rest, then the obvious choice is to make that species completely different than the rest. And if this hypothetical creator is all-powerful and all-knowing, they have the ability and knowledge required to do so. The fact that they did not either serves to demonstrate that they don't exist, or that we're not a special species that is separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. Well, obviously, he would use similarities, similar structures, to accomplish his goals. In other words, God was again too lazy or stupid to have designed a backbone specifically for upright walking. Instead, he just made minor changes to the ape backbone to make it mostly work, but in a way that is almost certain to cause chronic problems in adulthood. Again, not a good look if you want me to believe this creator is all-powerful and all-knowing and wanted us to be special. Similarity doesn't prove common ancestry. In fact, similarity argues more for a common creator than anything else. But then why the vast differences if similarity is an argument for a creator? The argument here seems to be that God is too lazy to create several independent designs for the same function, which doesn't exactly make God look good, but if that's what you want, then sure, go for it. But then why are there four different types of wings, and why are they placed among species in a way that fits what appears to be their evolutionary history? Why did no bat get a pterosaur wing, or vice versa? And what about eyes? Why do cephalopods get better eyes than humans? Why did God design ours differently? I know some of the differences are because cephalopods have to live underwater, but surely God could have at least not wired our eyes backwards with the optic nerve getting in the way of the retina. There are too many differences, and these differences add up in the exact way we would expect with the nested hierarchy of evolution. It just doesn't make sense from a creation perspective. Supposed evidence for evolution number three, the fossil record. You know what we're told is that you can look into the fossil record and you can find proof that organisms evolved over millions of years? The fossil record is actually one of the weaker points in favor of evolution. Which is kind of like saying that the biceps on a bodybuilder are stronger than the triceps. It is probably technically true, but they also work together in different ways and the different muscles are used to accomplish different goals. My point is that fossil evidence for evolution, while probably one of the weaker areas of evidence, is still pretty damn strong evidence. Supposedly we're told that you can find transformational organisms that prove this animal evolved into some other kind of animal. <sighs> you really need to work on your terminology. We have transitional fossils showing the development of certain lineages, yes. But if you were to take that seriously and you were to go to the fossil record, what you would find is that those transformational fossils are missing on a grand scale. Eh, not really. At least not when you take into account how rare the process of fossilization is. The fact that we have as much detail in the fossil record as we do is actually kind of amazing. In fact, evolutionist Mark Ridley stated that no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. Yes, you're absolutely right. Mark Ridley really did say that in an article in New Scientist from 1981. Now, New Scientist happens to be a publication that gives free access to its older archives, so that whole issue is available on Google Books for free. Let's look at the quote in context, shall we? Let's start with the title and blurb about this article. It's called Who Doubts Evolution? With a blurb beneath that states paleontologists disagree about the speed and pattern of evolution, but they do not, as much recent publicity has implied, doubt that evolution is a fact. The evidence for evolution simply does not depend upon the fossil record. So right out of the gate, I can tell that this quote will probably end up being about how the majority of evidence for the theory of evolution is actually independent of the fossil record and will provide examples of such. Now let's read the whole quote in context. Populations in the process of speciating are probably small and geographically separated from their ancestral population, so the full course of speciation will not be preserved at any one site of fossil deposition. What we would see is a series replaced by another, obviously related, and yet with no gradual intermediate forms. In any case, no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationalist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. This does not mean that the theory of evolution is unproven. So just what is 
is the evidence that species have evolved? There have traditionally been three kinds of evidence, and it is these, not the fossil evidence, that the critics should be thinking about. The three arguments are from observed evolution of species, from biogeography, and from the hierarchical structure of taxonomy. He then goes on to explain why each of these is very strong evidence in favor of evolution. So like I said, Fossil evidence is probably the weakest, but it's still there and is supported by several other entire bodies of evidence. Now, why would he say that? Well, he would say that because when you look at the fossil record, you see organisms coming into the fossil record fully formed. You see a stage of stasis where they do not change, and then they go out of the fossil record without evolving into anything else. And despite your very poor wording, the article that Mark Ridley wrote that you quoted explains not only why that is, but why it is expected. I'm going to skip the rest of your bit on fossils, and to explain why, I will quote the closing paragraph of Ridley's article. If the creationists want to impress the Darwinian establishment, it will be no use prating on about what the fossils say. No good Darwinian's belief in evolution stands on the fossil evidence for gradual evolution, so nor will his belief fall by it. What we want to know instead is what the creationists say about organic variation in space and time, in nature and the laboratory, and about the artificial manufacture of new species, about ring species of gulls, about the universality of the genetic code, and about a host of other cases of which these are but examples. Number four, the idea of mutations. We're told that mutations prove you could get a certain single-celled organism to mutate over multiplied millions of years and bring about new information on a grand scale that given enough time, you could get a human being. Man, you really need to work on your wording. You seem to have this knack of kind of getting it right, but making yourself sound really ignorant in the process. I mean. It could just be that you're really ignorant, but I try not to judge. The fact that mutations exist is not by itself proof of evolution. The theory of evolution was developed before genetics were discovered. It was essentially the simple observation that offspring are slightly different from their parents and that these differences tend to accumulate over time. Genetic mutations are one of the underlying mechanisms for these differences. There are several different types of mutations, from the changing of a single base pair to the duplication of the entire genome, and everything in between. These mutations have all been observed and studied. There is no reason to think that, given the billions of years that life has existed and the speed at which mutations are capable of affecting change, they could not be one of the mechanisms responsible for the diversification of life. What's the problem with that line of reasoning? Well, one of the problems is that it ignores some of the other mechanisms for genetic variation, such as sexual reproduction. The problem is that mutations don't give us new information. And this is where I'd like to get back to what you might be defining information as. I'm confident that no matter how you define it, we can point to an example of a mutation giving us new information. I've already pointed out duplication of both genes and entire genomes, which add quite a bit of new information in one single mutation event. Mutations can only take information that is already available and cause it to decay. What do you mean by decay? Is the ApoA1 Milano mutation an example of decay? That's a mutation that replaced one single amino acid in the apolipoprotein A1, which gives the people with this mutation protection against certain cardiovascular diseases. So it's a mutation that did not take anything out of the genetic code, and did not add anything into the genetic code, and has positive health effects to the point where they're doing clinical trials with this protein as a potential treatment for cardiovascular disease. Is this a decay? I'm not sure I would count it as an addition of information, since it's a point mutation, but it is a mutation that gives people a functional benefit. This is why you need to define what you mean by information. We have a useful change in structure mutation that didn't add or subtract anything from the genetic code. New function, no new information? Just define your terms next time. Mutations are an example of a loss of genetic information. Well, they can be. Genetic deletions are certainly a thing. But as I pointed out, so are duplications. I really wish a creationist in one of these types of videos would explain what they mean by information, because like the word kind, until you lock down a definition, it becomes a game of moving the goalposts. Let me give you an example. For the last hundred years or more now, scientists have been studying fruit flies. They are great 
examples of how you can mutate an organism. We have been zapping these fruit flies with radiation and mutating them in chemical ways for more than 100 years now. Yes, fruit flies are often used in evolutionary experiments because their generation span is so short. And yes, most experiments with fruit flies that I am aware of end up with the loss of a structure like eyes or wings or something. Does this mean we're going with the morphology definition of information here? The reason that they are so valuable to study is because you can get a new generation every 14 days. We have in that 100-year period the equivalent of what would be millions of years of evolutionary time. Firstly, that's just not the case. These are fruit flies we're talking about. There are lots of generations in a century, but that's still just one century of evolutionary time for fruit flies. I think what you mean to say there is that when compared to human generational times, it would be millions of years, but again, you're wrong. Fruit flies can actually give you a new generation every 10 days. One generation in 10 days gets us 36.5 generations per year, which gives us 3,650 generations over a century. Multiply that by the number of years generally considered to be a human generation, and I'll use the higher number that I found for that just to be generous, and we get 120,000 years. But this is where I'll admit that I'm probably doing something wrong with my math, because the longest running fruit fly experiment that I have found lasted for 60 years, and in the publications at the conclusion of the experiment in 2016 mentioned that it was 1500 generations for a human equivalent of 30,000 years. I trust the highly trained research scientists probably kept track of factors that I haven't even considered, so I'll go with their numbers. And what did they do in this experiment? They kept the fruit flies in complete darkness for their entire lives, with the exception of small groups that they would occasionally pull out to check progress. They didn't blast them with radiation or chemicals, they just let them live their lives in peace and complete darkness. After 60 years in blackout conditions, they had several adaptations that make life easier in the dark. They move around more in response to sudden light, even when allowed to readjust to life in a normal day-night cycle first. They are more sensitive to smells. They have larger head bristles, which for fruit flies function like the whiskers of a cat. They reproduce better when kept in the dark. They identified 220,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is where one single nucleotide in the genome is replaced with a different nucleotide, and 4,000 insertions or deletions. So most of the mutations did not change the overall length of the genetic code, it just swapped nucleotides out. Is that more or less information? And then 4,000 other mutations did affect the amount of genetic material either by inserting new material, which I think qualifies as new information, or deletions, which I think you would pluck out and say, see, the genetics are degrading. I couldn't find out in the study whether there were more insertions or deletions, but I don't really think it matters. And as a technicality, I will here point out that it is possible for deletions to be a beneficial mutation as well, so technically you could gain a new function with less genetic information through a deletion. And also to be fair, I will point out that of all these mutations, they were unable to determine with certainty which ones are adaptations that were selected for specifically because of their dark existence, because at some point during the 60-year experiment, the control group of fruit flies was lost. And what do you have after all the radiation and mutation? Do you have a fruit fly that has evolved new genetic information? Yes. Yes, we do, as can be seen from the 220,000 SNP mutations and the 4,000 indel mutations. No, you don't. In fact, all you still have is a fruit fly. It hasn't evolved into anything else. Specific to the study that I am referencing, no, it has not evolved into anything else. But it has shown mutations that lead to adaptations to a new environment, which, should these adaptations continue to accumulate, would easily end up with a speciation event where the dark flies are no longer able to breed with their wild counterparts. Keep in mind that if we were comparing this experiment to human time frames, it's the equivalent of 30,000 years of human evolution. As a species, modern Homo sapiens have been mostly the same for the past 300,000 years, so they haven't even touched on 10% of the time we've been around. With this in mind, it is completely understandable that they should still just be slightly different fruit flies at this time. Mutations don't prove evolution. You're right. They don't. Not by themselves, at any rate. That's simply not the mechanism that could get a single-celled organism to a human. It is one of the mechanisms, though. Not the only one to be sure, but a significant one. Number five, English peppered moths. We're told that English peppered moths provide an example of evolution in action. It's more of an example of one of the mechanisms of evolution in action. Specifically, natural selection. 
You see, before the Industrial Revolution, there were two varieties of English peppered moths. One dark colored, one light colored, but the light colored was much higher in ratio than the dark colored. But after the Industrial Revolution, the dark colored became the more prominent color and the light, the fewer in the mix. And we're told that's because birds could see the light colored better, etc. And this was supposedly an example of natural selection. Yes. Yes, it is. And I'm pretty sure I know where you're going with this, so let me just point out that the peppered moths are an example of natural selection, not evidence for natural selection. Natural selection is one of those parts of evolution that creationists generally have to try and work into their own models, because it's so well demonstrated. In fact, I'm going to skip past the claim that they were glued on tree trunks for pictures, because ultimately that is irrelevant to my overall point. I want to address your second problem with the peppered moths. But the second problem was that before the Industrial Revolution, the genetic information in the English peppered moth genome had genetic information for two varieties, light colored and dark colored. Yes, exactly. The genes for the darker moths already existed at the same time as the genes for the lighter moths. The darker moths didn't just suddenly mutate into existence and completely replace the white ones. The mutation for the darker wings was already there, but the selection pressure changed during the Industrial Revolution. In non-industrial areas, the population stayed predominantly white, while in the industrial areas, black became dominant. The soot from the factories changed the selection pressure, which then changed which variant was favored in that environment. It's an example of natural selection at work. That's all it was ever meant to be. And it's a good example that shows that mutations don't have any goals in mind. Creationists will often phrase things in a way that makes the process sound intentional, like a fish one day decided to grow stubby legs so that its descendants may one day walk. Did the grasshoppers think through how other animals would avoid it if it looked more camouflaged? Did it know how to genetically engineer itself to express those colors? No, that's not how it works. It's more like these moths here, where for unknown reasons some of the moths shared a mutation. This mutation ended up being beneficial in some environments more than others, so the moths with the mutations became dominant in those environments. If those environments remain stable long enough, this mutation will eventually become the norm. Wash, rinse, repeat. Natural selection. And after, the genetic information was the same. Yes, in that short time period, the genes were the same. But do you know what was different? The gene frequencies in the moth populations in successive generations, which is basically the definition of evolution. And number six, horse evolution. Really? Another example? Dude, examples are not the evidence. You can pick apart all the examples you like, but ultimately even if you ended up being correct in the ones you pick apart, that does not mean we throw out all the evidence that we have at this point. If you were to look in your biology textbooks, you would see that horse evolution is often used as evidence that evolution really occurred. No, no it is not. It is presented as one of the cases where a specific aspect of the evolution of a modern animal is actually well documented in the fossil record. We can see the evolution of the hoof from a very much hand-like structure in the Hyracotherium to the extended middle toe hoof of the modern horse. You would see a, a picture of a very small animal, almost looks like a fox or something like that, evolving into modern horse. But this scenario, it's fabricated. It's not true. It was made up. Hyracotherium doesn't exist? Nor do Mesohippus mericippus or Pleohippus? Fascinating. What evidence do you have to support the claim that these four species are all hoaxes? In fact, more than 50 years ago, Dr. George Gaylord Simpson said the uniform continuous transformation of Hyracotherium into Equus so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers never happened in nature. So this book doesn't appear to have been digitized yet, and my library does not have access to this particular book. I mean, it's from 1953. Even using interlibrary loans, it was a long shot. But from what I have learned about Dr. Simpson himself, it appears that he was engaged in an ongoing argument with other paleontologists of the time, similar to the debate between punctuated equilibrium and gradualism. In this case, the debate was whether evolution had a goal, and Dr. Simpson was on the side that it did not have a goal. An example he was apparently fond of using was the evolution of the horse. It is often pictured as linear, a progression from the primitive Hyracotherium to the modern, more specialized Equus. 
Knowing this, I can say with a fairly high degree of certainty that when he said, the uniform continuous transformation of Hierakotherium into Equus never happened in nature, he was referring to the straight line progression as opposed to a more haphazard branching tree with several side branches that ended up extinct. So he was not saying that horses didn't evolve. You see this? information that's presented to us as proof that evolution actually occurred is not proof at all. If we look at it with an open mind and we study it carefully and we critically consider it, we'll realize that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and all of the organisms and evolution just simply didn't play any part in God's creation. I'm sorry, but even if you had completely debunked the entire theory of evolution in this video, which you haven't, you have done nothing to demonstrate even the possibility of the existence of a god, much less that this god made everything in a way that is entirely consistent with him having not made anything. That's it for this video. Just to recap, his six points to not believe evolution were as follows. Number one, vestigial organs. They exist and sometimes have functions and are a really weird thing to be there if they were specially designed. Two, homology. All-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe was somehow too lazy to actually make the most special part of his creation look any more special than the rest of it. 3. The fossil record. Not primary evidence for evolution either way, more of a supporting cast member, but still excellent evidence for evolution. 4. Mutations. Something about information, I guess? I don't really know how several examples of beneficial mutations adding genetic material into the genome are just hand-waved away. Number five, peppered moths. Excellent example of natural selection, not evidence for evolution by themselves. And six, horse evolution. Again, excellent example of an evolutionary lineage in the fossil record, but not really evidence all by itself. Fun times. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Truth of Christ 777 who says, If everything came from primordial soup, then surely it would be easy to make it all happen again using modern scientific methods. Then why hasn't anyone done it? Because it's all a scam, that's why. The eternal struggle between good versus evil. Satan doesn't want you believing in the god of creation so that you'll be destroyed. Wake up and do your own research. Evolution is a fairy tale for atheists. Are you really arrogant enough to think that humans have the ability to duplicate everything that can be found in nature? There's plenty of stuff that we know happens in nature that we can't duplicate in the lab. Just because humans can't do something yet doesn't make that thing impossible. So remember to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and support me on Patreon. See you next time.